Our message tonight is entitled, Revelation Saints and the 144,000. You know, the Bible says, when the Lord shall build up Zion, then he shall appear in his glory. God will have a people in the end of time that will match the message entrusted to them. You see, in every age of church history, God's people have had a part in truth, a piece of the mirror, if you will. But in the end of time, Revelation is a book where all the books of the Bible meet and end. It's a book where God gathers all the little nuggets of Scripture, all the experiences, all the revelations, and he brings it into one whole in the end of time. It's the final application of the everlasting gospel. It's the final unfolding of the great message that will display, like never before, a beautiful image of Jesus Christ in his people. But notice the people must match the very message given to them. In fact, we're living in a time where God is giving a restoration, if you will, of the everlasting gospel. We read that in the book of Acts chapter 3, verse 19 to 21, where the Bible says, uh, Be ye converted, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive unto the times of restitution of all things. And we are living in the time where God is restoring all things. The obedience of the faith that he once gave unto the saints. Jude in verse 3. Let's look at Romans now. Let's go to Romans, the last chapter of the book of Romans. And I want you to notice here, in the book of Romans, notice what Paul refers to when he speaks about the mystery that we have discussed before, the mystery hid from generations, Christ in you, the hope of heaven, the hope of glory. And here in Romans chapter 16, and we'll read beginning in verse 25. Notice what it says. Now to him, and this is the epilogue of the chapter, it's the final appeal. It says, now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. And by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of what? The obedience of faith. So God expects us to obey what he's revealed. And he's never given any generation besides ours today a revelation in his totality of himself. We have the history of prophets, of the apostles. We have the history of God's working and dealing with his people from the beginning down to the end of verse history. And we have this last book of the Bible, which is a revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And we know that the servants in the end of time, as we read right here, are those that obey the one faith, right? Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his ours to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. And so this collective group in the end of time that's universal in every nation, kindred, and tongue are brought to view in Revelation chapter 7. This chapter we're going to look at tonight is the follow-up to chapter 6, where it ends with this, For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? In other words, who's going to stand faithful in that day when Christ comes again? And let's read the answer now, friends. Let's go to Revelation chapter 7. In Revelation 7, we look at verse 1, 2, and 3. And notice how it begins. It says, After these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Now we know that the four winds represent something universal. The Bible says in Matthew 24, verse 30 and 31, that he shall send forth his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, right? From one end of heaven to the other end. It's symbolic in its application. And here the Bible says that the wind should not blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. The winds in Scripture represent strife. So God's depicting that in the final scenes of earth's history, there's going to be a lot of strife, strife of individuals, strife of nations. And in the midst of that, he's going to have a people that will stand for him in the midst of the strife. And of course, the trees and the earth, the green things are symbolic. Notice Revelation chapter 9. Let's go to Revelation 9 just to get an idea of what it represents. Look now at verse 4. Revelation 9 and verse 4. The Bible says, And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Did you get that? So notice the green trees and the, and the grass. It's a symbol of men. 
not only those men who have not, it says in verse 4, the seal of God in their foreheads. So when the Bible talks in Revelation chapter 7, he's holding the four winds of the earth that the wind should not blow on the earth nor on the tree or in any green thing. It's talking about those who are planted by rivers of righteousness. In other words, they're, they're trees that grow by faith in Jesus Christ. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 7. And notice here, beginning now in verse 3, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God, where? In their forehead. So here's a group that take the seal of God. And let me say again, they're in every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. They're in the four winds of the earth. Now, who are those who take the seal of God? Who are they that will be alive when Jesus comes again? These are the living saints, if you will. These are those who will be translated like Enoch of old. They will not see death. They, this mortal will put on immortality, according to the Bible. Now look now at verse 4. Here we have the answer. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now notice how John hears the number of them. And the Bible says what he hears is not what he sees. You understand that? And we know already, as we've learned in the past, we're not talking about literal bloodline Israelites or descendants of Abraham. The Bible says if you are Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise of God. What advantage hath the Jew is what Paul is asking in Romans chapter 2, verse 20 to 29, chapter 3, verse 1 and 3. He says right there, much every way that unto them were committed the oracles of God. And so there's one time when they had the truth, right? But they forfeited the truth. He came into his own, but his own received them not. Jesus says the kingdom of God is going to be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruit thereof. Now we're living in a time where the Israel of God is a spiritual nation. There are universal applications. God's people in every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. But God does not make that distinction, if you will, on the surface in Revelation chapter 7. We must understand that. We must know that through our study of the Bible. And I'm going to show you why. He hears the number of them, and he hears a number, and the Bible says 144,000. And he lists the 12 tribes. In each tribe, we find 12,000. But notice something. In the Greek, in the original Greek, the word is thousand or thousands, plural. It's inclusive, thousand or thousands, because now the prophet is going to turn to look, and what he sees is not what he hears. Let's look at verse 9. After this, the Bible says, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Ever, amen. Look at verse 13. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And he said, or I said unto him, Sir, you know. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of what? Great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Do you realize in the original Greek, which we don't need it because we're going to find out we don't, but incidentally, in the original Greek, you know what it really says there? These are they that came out of tribulation, the great one. You understand? By emphasis. Does the Bible predict a time of trouble the world's never seen that will happen in the end of time? That time of trouble is found in Daniel chapter 12. So let's go there. And notice what it says here in Daniel chapter 12. And let's read here beginning in verse 1, 2, and 3. The Bible says in Daniel 12, verse 1, 2, and 3, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of what? It says a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even at that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. So notice the idea of searching is going on. God searches the books. The judgment has begun. And when that work is complete, that's when he comes to give to every man according as his work shall be. Verse 2, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. And so what we're looking at here is that John hears the number, and he has 12,000 or 12,000s, and he turns to look, and he sees a great multitude which no man could what? 
No man can number. In other words, when Jesus comes again and the message goes out with power into all the world and many respond by coming out of Babylon, the Bible is not telling us that it's going to be 144,000, not one less or one more. God will have people in all the world. And the Bible says a great multitude which no man could number. We're reading right here in Daniel 12, the saints that go through the time of trouble, the world's never seen before. In fact, friends, do you know why God mentions the 12 tribes here? Because the Bible says in the book of Revelation chapter 21, the heavenly Jerusalem has 12 gates. It also has 12 foundations. The 12 gates have above each gate the names of the tribes of Israel. But the Bible says in Revelation 21 that the 12 foundations around the city have the names of the 12 apostles of Jesus Christ. Now the Bible says, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter into the gates into the city. So you're not telling me that only those who are literally the Israelites out of the 12 tribes can only go through those gates. Are you with me, yes or no? In fact, the Bible says, Jerusalem, which is above, is the mother of us all. All the saints, those who live in the Old Testament, who believe by faith in what Jesus promised, and those who live in the New Testament, who believe by faith in what Jesus has accomplished already, they will all enter into those gates because they overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Can you say amen? In fact, let's go to the book of uh, Genesis chapter 49. Genesis chapter 49, and notice here we find the foundation to the 12 tribes of Israel. Notice here, this prophecy is about the last days. And so it says here in verse 1, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you, underscore this, in the last days. When now? It says in the last days. So this prophecy he's about to give concerning his 12 sons is not really for them, it's for whom? It's for us in the last days to understand what it really means. Now look at verse 2. Gather yourselves together, and hear ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. Now he's going to outline all the twelve sons of Jacob. And notice the characters of these twelve sons will indeed parallel the characters of the twelve apostles or disciples of Jesus Christ. But they were sanctified by the grace of God. Now friends, remember how the twelve sons of Jacob deceived, and they, they took the life or tried to take the life of uh, Joseph? And they sold them through the process of time, through the conviction of God's spirit, as they begin to mature and understand the cause and effect of their ill decision. Did they come to appreciate their brother, Joseph? Were they sorry for their sin? Yes. And so the disciples of Jesus, weren't they hard? Remember what Jesus said to John and uh, James, called them the sons of what? The sons of thunder. Peter's heart was hard. He denied his Lord, even with cursing. He was compulsive, wasn't he? But were they eventually sanctified by the grace of their Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Notice this. Look at Reuben. Look at verse 3. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. But notice the weakness of Reuben. Unstable as what? You're as unstable as water. Thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed. You defiled it. He went up to my couch. Now, Reuben was the one that was unstable. So what disciple often would speak before he would think? Who was kind of unstable, if you will? The apostle Peter, right? Do you see how Peter would parallel Reuben here? Now, we don't have the time to go through all 12 of them, but let's look at one more. Look at verse 5. Notice how all of them are brothers, but yet verse 5 kind of pairs two of them together. Look at verse 5. Simon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitation. O my soul, come not thou into their secret, into their assembly, mine honor. Be not thou united, for in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. So notice how they were, what, angry brethren, right? They were very, very angry and mad. Remember the two brothers that walked with Jesus Christ? We just talked about them. James and John, the most tender-hearted John the Apostle after he was sanctified, I'm telling you. Remember, after he had an experience with Jesus Christ. But he was the one through Samaria that said, Lord, they're not going to put you up for the night. These are Gentiles. They're lost. Call fire down from heaven and consume them. And what did Jesus say? You know not what spirit you are of. The Son of Man came not to condemn, but to seek and save that which is lost. Amen? 
So Jesus rebuked him mildly, but he rebuked him. Do you see how these two brothers parallel James and John? Let's look at just one more. Let's go to the chapter 49. Turn the page or just drop down. Look at verse um, 17. And by the way, Dan, who's mentioned here, is not mentioned in Revelation chapter 7. Judas, who fell away from Jesus, right, was replaced. Look at verse 17. Dan shall be a what? A serpent, by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse's heel so that his rider shall fall backward. So Dan was a backbiter. Did Judas deny our Lord? Did he sell our Lord for 30 pieces of silver? You understand that? So we're looking at Revelation chapter 7. We're not looking at literal Israelites. We're looking at spiritual Israelites, the great multitude, which no man could number, those saints who will be alive to go through the great tribulation that will look up and say, this is our God, we have waited for him, and we will rejoice in his salvation. Let's go to the book of Revelation now. And I want you to notice here in Revelation chapter 15, because in this chapter, we find an illustration. The Bible says that the saints that stand on the sea of glass, they will sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Because what the Israelites went through in the time of the Exodus will be similar in nature to what God's people will go through in the world before God delivers them in the end of time. So look at chapter 15, beginning now. And verse 2, And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark. So are these those that live in the very end of time, that will come face to face with the mark of the beast? Yes, they're, they're living saints. And then it says in verse 2, it says, Standing on the sea of glass, having the hearts of God, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Now the reason why the Bible says they sing the song of Moses and the Lamb, it's taken our minds back to that historical time. When God led his people out of Egypt, Miriam, the sister of Moses, led out with the choir, did she not? Praising God for his great deliverance. They were singing the song of victory, if you will. And this is why we find in Revelation chapter 14, when it mentions this number yet again, that they sing a song which no man could learn because it will be a song of an experience, as it says in Psalm 98, verse 1 and 2. Sing the song of victory, a new song, David says. Let's go to Revelation 14 and read it for ourselves. Notice Revelation 14, beginning in verse 1. This is following chapter 13, and chapter 13 ends with the majority that take the mark of the beast. That's what it says right there. They worship the beast, they take his number, right? The names of blasphemy, and they take his mark. And then, notice God looks at the saints, and look at chapter 14, verse 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written where? In their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great molten thunder. And as the, uh, the, I heard the voice of harps harping with their harps. Look at verse 3. And they sung as it were a what? There you go. A new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the what? The earth. Not Jerusalem. But the Bible says from the earth. They're redeemed from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Are you getting it? And look at verse 4. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Now, friends, we know this is not talking about in a literal sense, right? Just like the whole chapter is symbolic. This is a metaphor. It's a representation of a faith that they have. The Bible says, I have espoused you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And the Bible says they're not defiled with women. Do you know why? Because it says in the book of Hebrews 13, verse 4, that marriage is honorable in the bed undefiled. So it's not talking about in a literal sense. Amen, ladies? It's talking about women of prophecy. Tell me something. Does the Bible talk about a mother that has daughters? That has fallen from the truth? And what is the name of that mother and the daughters together? Babylon the Great has what? Has fallen. The mother church, she has all the daughter churches, and they're all eating at Jezebel's table we learned Friday night. And they're drinking her wine, remember? And the Bible says because they're intoxicated, they're going to make an image to the mother. An image will be set up, the mark will be enforced, and that will heal the wound of the mother church. And God says, come out of her who? He says, come out of her, my people, because Babylon is falling right now. And there's precious people that are in Babylon that know the truth that better make their move before it's too late. 
They better act on the knowledge that they have, or the Bible says the seven last plagues will come upon the wicked world. And the seven last plagues are mentioned in Revelation 16, and every single plague is but a response to a particular commandment that the world has rejected. The Bible says the waters will be turned to blood. Why? Because they have shed the blood of innocent people. The Bible says that the sun will turn into hot. They will scorch the earth. People want to worship the sun, God will give them the sun, right? It's what they want. Just like when the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant and they took the law of God that was in the Ark, the Bible says plagues came from the Ark onto the Philistines. Why? They were mocking the law. And in the end of time, when people worship the beast by how they act, the, the choices that they make in following the beast, the plagues will come from the Ark of the Covenant in heaven. And it will come upon a wicked world and they'll reap what they have what? What they have sown. And that day when it comes, that's when probation closes. And just like in Goshen, where God preserved the Israelites from the ten last plagues, then God will preserve his spiritual Israel in the end of time from the plagues that will fall upon a wicked world. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 14. So we're looking at spiritual women, spiritual adultery. They are not defiled with women. They have come out of them. They've made their decision to follow Jesus Christ. Look at verse 4. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. Whatever Jesus says, do they, do they follow? Do they obey? The Bible says, as soon as they hear of me, they are to obey me. Jesus says, walk in the light while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you, right? And today we have the light, do we not? God is speaking to us through his word. And so they follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Now look at verse 4. It says, these were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Now we know that when Jesus resurrected 2,000 years ago, there were many that were sleeping in the graves that came out of the graves after his resurrection. These, in essence, were the first fruits of the harvest that will come at the second coming, when the dead in Christ shall rise. But the first fruits mentioned here are not in terms of numbers, but in terms of quality. You know, when you get the first fruits and you show your family how God has blessed your garden, you pick the very best, right? So the context is the quality of the pick in the end of time. Because remember, the church in their character, in their faith, will match the revelation of Jesus Christ that God has entrusted to them. In other words, in the end of time, God's going to see the travail of his soul. What he's going to witness is a trophy showcase of what his grace can do in the lives of pitiful, pathetic, and sinful men and women. Amen? And it's going to show, it's going to shine like the glory of the sun. They're going to see Jesus in us. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw what? All men unto me. And before he comes again, before probation closes, the people of God will shine the brightest when the earth is at its darkest. Do you see the contrast? This is the privilege each and every one of us have, I believe with all my heart today, that God has called us to a high and holy calling to follow him without reservation. Look at this. Look at chapter 14 in verse 5. Yes, they're the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Now, I believe the next verse is the most important verse that gives a description, a vivid one, of the 144,000. It says, And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Did you see that, friends? The Bible says they stand without fault before the throne of God. Now, we're going to find out tonight that as we've learned that Revelation's a book where all the books of the Bible meet and end, they meet because every book has a revelation that ties into the last book of the Bible. It ends because God takes every prophecy of the past, whatever it's mentioned in the Bible, and shows a universal application of it in Revelation. Now, the 144,000 is not the first time it's mentioned that we find right here in this chapter. We're going to find it all throughout the Bible, in fact. Let's go to the book of Psalm, chapter 15. Notice Psalm 15. We're going to go back to the Old Testament, chapter 15. In this whole chapter, it's a very short chapter, describes, in essence, the very people who will stand in the last days. Notice what it says. Okay? A lot of people think, you know, it's the, the educated preacher that's going to be the only one, really, that's going to make up this number. Those who are engaged actively in the work. That's not what the Bible teaches. Are you with me? It's not the flaming evangelist. It's not the charismatic pastor. It is the lay people. It is the people that love Jesus enough. It doesn't exclude them. You understand that? But it also includes every single soul that is willing to put Jesus first in their life in the last days. Notice what it says. Look at verse 1. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Do you understand the question? 
He's asking, just like in Revelation, who will stand in that day? Who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? The answer comes back in verse 2. He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is condemned. But he honors them that fear the Lord. He that swears to his own hurt and does not change. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. Amen. God says they will stand as pillars, as rocks in the last days, unmoved. Why? Because they're following the spirit of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's go to the book of Zephaniah. Zephaniah mentions the very same group. Look at Zephaniah. It's going to be in the Minor Prophets after the book of Daniel. Zephaniah chapter 3, beginning now in verse 8, just to get the historical context. Look, now it says, Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms, and to pour upon them mine indignation. Even all my fierce anger for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Look at verse 9. For then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with what? One consent or one accord. Just like in the days of the apostles, one consent. They're going to be united, are they not? Upon the platform of God's eternal truth. Now look at verse 13. Here we have a description of the group. It says, the remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies. Neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He hath cast out thine enemy. The King of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil any more. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion, let not thy hands be slack. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee, he is mighty. He will save, he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with what? God himself says, I'm going to sing over the joy of my people. Now we've heard some talented musicians in this series, right? We know the angels can sing, though we can't hear it by faith. We know they have a beautiful voice. They sing, the Bible says, without ceasing, day and night. Why? Because they give praise to the Lamb, don't they? Can you imagine the voice of the eternal God when he sees what his grace is doing in the lives of people in the last days as he shows the world his trophy showcase, right? He's going to sing over the glory of his people. Friends, I can't wait for that. What do you say? He's going to sing. God himself will sing. Now, the Bible says in Revelation 12, verse 17, a, a war is coming. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So we know that we're in a war, that war began in heaven. It didn't start here, but it came down here, right? And it involves every single one of us as individuals. And the devil knows he's not going to get these people to openly and blatantly violate God's commandments. Why? Because they know better. So he's going to come in very, very subtle ways. Very subtle ways. You know, the railroad track has to be perfectly parallel. If it's not, if it's off a millimeter, right, down the road or down the way, it will diverge eventually into a great valley. And so he doesn't come openly and blatantly, but he works in very subtle ways. The Bible says it's the little foxes, right, that spoil the vines. Often little things can they not complicate everything. Are you with me? And so the Bible says, he that which is faithful and that which is least will be faithful and that which is much. You know, when Hitler invaded France, he often would transition and turn these corporations into places where they would produce weapons for his army. And often the French would take off their sabot, which is shoe in French, and they would take it and they would put it into the machine secretly and it would grind all the machinery and bring it to a grinding halt. And that's where we get the word sabo sabotage. Are you with me? So the word sabotage. So the devil wants to sabotage, doesn't he? The experience that Jesus is hoping the church will have in the very end of time. Come with me now to 1 John chapter 3. Let's read this verse that's going to show you what spirit we should take tonight's revelation in. This is it right here. 
Do you want a verse that's going to underline exactly how we should accept the very revelation of heaven through his word? This is going to be it right here. Look at verse uh, 22. 1 John 3, verse 22. The Bible says, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments, and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Now notice something, friends. There's something else besides keeping God's commandments, isn't it right? It says we ought to do that. That's basic. That's the very first rung on the ladder. That's the very elementary thing we should be doing as Christians. But the Bible says we should be choosing the things that are pleasing in his sight. That means that we're going to refrain from the things that just may be displeasing in his sight, right? And I guarantee you, when we understand what this verse means, we're going to race through the Bible looking for phrases, concepts, principles, words, something we can learn from Scripture that is a testament of Jesus Christ that will help us to understand how we can please Him. It doesn't have to be in black and white. For if our heart is in tune with our Heavenly Father, we will know, right? All we'll need is a hint. This is nothing new. Let's go to the book of Isaiah 56 and notice that they were required to please God as well. So Isaiah 56 and we're going to read together here, beginning in verse 4. The Bible speaks about the Gentiles. They're going to come in, and notice they're also going to keep the Sabbath too, and they're going to please God. Verse 4, For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant. You see that? You see, this is really where our growing in grace is involved. The Bible instructs us, the Spirit convicts us. We move out there in loving submission and service to our Heavenly Father. Now, did Jesus live this type of life, yes or no? Well, let's read it. Look at John chapter 8, verse 29, the Gospel of John. And notice what Jesus said about His relation to His Father and how our relation should be to Him. Look at verse 29 of John 8. Jesus said, And He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, Jesus says, for I do always those things that what? That please him. What, what is Jesus saying? I don't just keep his commandments. I don't just do that. He goes, I go beyond that, doesn't he? He goes, I choose the things I can find, phrases, hints, things that I know will be pleasing in his sight. You know what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter, what is it, chapter 11, verse 5, 1 through 5? that Enoch was translated because he had this testimony that he what? That he pleased God. You know what this really reminds me of? Remember the prodigal son, the story Jesus told about how he wanted his inheritance early because he wanted to go to the local city and squander it. You know, he wanted to have a good time. And so his father granted it because he begged him, right? So he gave it to him. And so he went and he just totally gave it away, spent it on uh, ill things. And before you know it, it he burnt everything up, right? And he realized he had nothing. So he was eating things that were where the pigs were. And so he says, listen, my servants of my father eat better than I do. I may go back and see if my father would take me just as a servant, right? So his heart, through his experience, was humble. He realized his danger and his utter weakness, right? So he's set back to go. Now, remember the older brother when he came? how he saw his younger brother and his father was so overwhelmed with joy that his son had come back that he put his arm around him. He says, put shoes and give him the best robe. Let's kill the fatted calf. He was dead, but is what? He's alive again. He was lost and is found. Was he excited about it? Yes, but his older brother, right? He was angry. Do you know why? Because all he could see was his duty. He was doing all the right things. He had all the right knowledge. He could truthfully say, all these years I have served you. I have not departed. I haven't asked you for a dime. But you never killed a fatted calf for me. You never threw a party for me. He could truthfully say that right. He wasn't lying. He had been faithful. But let me tell you something. He did not in the process understand the heart desires of his father. He didn't understand how his father was hurting inside. If he had, he would have been out there looking for his younger brother, right? And begging him to come back to be with the family again. But he couldn't see all that, you see. All he saw was his duty, the requirements. He wasn't in tune with the heart of his father. And likewise, listen, we can do all the right things in our lives and be totally oblivious to the heart desires of our Heavenly Father. Don't just keep God's commandments. Go beyond that and choose the things that are pleasing in his sight. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. Look at Hebrews 12. And notice what the Apostle Paul says about the Christian. Hebrews 12. 
And this, by the way, this motive, this approach will give you joy in the Christian walk. If it's always, what more do I have to give up for him? Believe me, you're going to be miserable. I was miserable. You're going to be miserable, right? We fight every day against the flesh. But I tell you what, if our attitude is, what more can I do for him? What more can I do for Jesus Christ? You don't have time to think about yourself. You're thinking of others. You're thinking about him. And your life will be nothing but a constant growth and joy in the Lord. Amen? Nothing can replace it. There's nothing in the world can offer you to replace the joy and peace that comes from heaven. And believe me, I can tell you that as a fact. Look at chapter 12 and verse 1. The Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So the Bible says clearly right here that we're all running in a race. And I'll tell you what, how much weight we carry as we run will determine whether we reach the finish line. Now, the race is today, only one person can win. But the good news, God says, every one of us can win, right, in this race. Just finish the finish line. You're going to win the race. Notice he says, lay aside, it says, every weight and the sin, which does so easily beset us. Now listen carefully. We know what sin is. Sin is the transgression of God's law. That's breaking God's commandments. If we're breaking it willingly, we need to lay that aside and keep them. But it says, lay aside the sin and the weights, right? Are you with me? There's other things that are not glaring sins, but yet just may be displeasing to God. They may not be heaven or hell issues, but there may be issues that down the road can separate us in our relationship with him. Are you with me? The Bible says the weights. I remember this. I'll show you an image of my competition, but I've told you this before. I used to be heavily involved in competitive bodybuilding. And I remember that when I, I competed for my show in 95, uh, I was about 200 and... 45, 250 pounds at one time. And I remember I had to diet down, so I had to do cardio twice a day. Uh, I started with 30 minutes, and then I go to 45 minutes in an hour twice a day. So I remember when I started out, I would uh, power walk. You know what power walking is? Where you're walking so fast, but you're not actually running or jogging. And I tell you what, if you, have to, if you keep up that consistent pace, your side starts hurting. For an hour? Come on, it hurts. But you must press on, because if you don't, keep walking at a pace, you're not going to lose the body fat that you need to to stand next to the guys that are next to you under the lights. And if you're not in shape, you're going to be the laughing stock of a thousand people. You understand? So you have to press, you have to work hard. And I remember as I kept walking and walking and walking, it got easier and easier and easier. Why? Because I started losing the excess weight. Are you with me? A lot of times Christians, they walk around with their head down. They know the truth. There's no love there. They may want it, but they're always just looking down and they're miserable and they're depressed. There's something wrong. Let me tell you what's wrong. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. For my yoke is light and my burden is easy. Amen? So there's a problem somewhere. That's what he said. So where's the problem? I'll tell you what the problem is. People are holding on to too many weights. They're holding on with the world with one hand and they're holding on to God with the other and they want the best of both worlds, right? And the Bible says you can't have that. That's the sacrifice that's involved. And there is a sacrifice and it hurts. Believe me, there's things I want. There's things I want to go back to. There are pulls to the world every day in my life. But I know in the end, there's nothing but destruction. So I have to look at the end from the beginning. I have to by faith say, you know what? Do I want to live forever? Yes or no? Amen? You have to ask yourself that question. The Bible says, examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith or not. And you have to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. There is a work for us to do every single day. And every day that I'm pulled back into the world, pulled back into vanity, pulled back into self, I always have to look at what the Savior who made heaven and earth did for me. He hung upon the cross to an open shame. That's enough for me. What do you say? That is it. He is the one who has given me life in such a horrible way he died so that I can have what he deserves. And that always motivates me, doesn't it? To say, you know what? Nope. I'm going to keep on the narrow path. I'm going to keep on the narrow path. And we have to do that every day. If we don't do it every day, we're going to slip right back. And one day it may be too late. The point of no return. One day it may be. I'm not saying it will, but one day it may be unless we keep pressing on to that day. What are some of the weights, friends, that the devil's bringing in that may keep us down? What are some of the ways that Jesus warned us against? Let's go to the book of Mark chapter 5. Let's read it. Mark chapter 5. 
In Mark chapter 5, let's look at verse... Um, Actually, we're going to look at Mark chapter 4. Look at Mark 4 in verse 24. The Bible says, or Jesus says, And he said unto them, Take heed to what ye hear. Now, did you get that? Jesus here warns us from hearing any and everything, right? In other words, we have to be discriminating. He says, take heed to what you hear. Friends, what we hear, can it alter our decisions? Can it affect our subconscious mind? and alter our behavior. In fact, notice Isaiah 33. This talks about the 144,000, if you want to see the context of that. Look at Isaiah 33, and here we're going to see about the last days. And we're going to look at chapter 33. Let's drop down to verse 2. It says here, O Lord, be gracious unto us. We have waited for thee. Be thou their arm every morning, our salvation also in the time of trouble. The time of trouble is coming, Daniel 12, verse 1 through 3. The Bible says the Lord is going to be our salvation during that time. But notice what God says we must do to prepare for that time. Look now at verse, um, look at verse 14. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burning? So the question is, basically and essentially, who is going to stand faithful in that day? The answer comes back in verse 15. He that walketh what? Righteously. And speaketh uprightly, and he that despiseth the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, that stops his ears from hearing of blood, and shutteth his eyes from seeing of evil. He shall dwell on high, his place of defense shall be the munition of rocks. Bread shall be given him, and his water shall be sure. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the lamb that is very far off. So the promise is, you're going to inherit eternal life. The new earth, right? Is what he's talking about. But then he said, you'll see the king coming in his power and great glory. But the Bible says, they that keep their ears from hearing of blood. Listen, friends. Can music alter our behavior today? Look at our younger generation, right? Look how the, the priorities have just totally plummeted. Why? Because they're hearing all kinds of things that are just reaching their subconscious mind. You know why? It wears them and wears them down every day. That's all they want to listen to. They think life is like this. They want to be like what they hear. And they become an easy prey and target for the enemy. There was a song. Many of you probably will remember this. But I grew up in the 80s, right? Growing up in high school. It went like this. Some men want to use you. And some men want to be abused by you. And these are what see, dreams are made of? Are you with me? So the devil knows that music, listen, the Bible says in the day that he was created, his pipes were perfect. He was the, probably the heavenly choir leader. Was the devil in the music business in heaven? Beautiful angel, beautiful voice. Is he still in the music business today? Jesus says, take heed to what ye want, to what ye hear. Now there's some good classical music out there. Uh, there I'm not knocking all music, uh, but there's music out there that are just exploiting uh, you know, basically revealing immorality and, and totally destroying our young people. Uh, the Bible says, take heed to what you hear. And even country music, you know, think about it. Let, let, me, let me just be a little bit more specific here tonight so that we can understand what we're dealing with. You know, all my exes live in Texas, right? It's adultery, isn't it? Divorce, that's why I hang my hat in Tennessee. You know, Billy Bob stole my pickup truck and now I've got a new woman every single week, every single month. Are you with me? We listen to this as we're driving along, but what we don't realize is that it does contribute to our characters. It does. The Bible says take heed. Now, there's some good music. I'm not knocking on music, but we have to be discriminating as Christians, right? We have to choose you this day whom we're going to serve. And the Bible says right here that shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. Now, some people call it the idiot box. Some people call it the one-eyed monster. But ever since the television has come in every home, have our morals gone down the tube? Is there anything wrong with the television? Let me tell you something. I love a good story. When I was growing up as a young boy, I've always wanted to be a movie director. I've written scripts. And so I know a lot about the entertainment business. But I tell you what, there's nothing evil in a television. But it's what comes on the television. Let's be honest. Let's there was a time when you couldn't even see a baby's behind on television. But now you don't have to order cable. You don't have to get any adult channels that they have today. You can watch the general programming. And women are half-dressed, undressed, right? And our children look at this. We wonder why, wonder why they're engaged in the very behaviors that they are today. 
The Bible says, train up a child in the way which they shall go. When they're old, they will not depart from it, right? So there's a principle involved. And so as parents, we have to be responsible for what we allow them to behold, right? And there's a danger if you keep them too much away from the world that they're going to rebel, right? So you have to be balanced. There's a world out there. They have to understand that there is danger, that there's wickedness. But we have to train their minds to behold purity, right? To value purity. And when they grow up, they'll realize the danger and they will be repulsed by it. So the Bible says take heed to what you see. And I think if we could talk about the TV today in the homes, the theaters will take care of themselves, right? The theaters will take care of themselves. Look what we're witnessing here. I mean, we're, violence. Do you know why we're seeing so much violence in our public schools? Kids taking guns and shooting their peers. You know why? Because Hollywood is saturated with violence. Our kids are raised to watch this. Even the little cartoons decapitate characters, right? Video games, you know, the mature video games where the blood goes everywhere. It's unbelievable. And they watch this and they grow up and they get depressed because there's no joy in their life. They don't have a, a, an expected in a future. And what? They want to take out what they've been fed on other people. That's what's happening. Monkey see, monkey what? The Bible says we look through a glass darkly, but then face to face and we're changed in the same image. If you behold Jesus, you become more like him. If you're beholding the world, without question, you will become more like the world. It is a principle of human nature, isn't it? The Bible says we are carnal, sold under sin. We are not righteous. We are naturally gravitated toward these things. This is what we love. To be a Christian means that we have to pursue it. We have to work and sacrifice and overcome. It's not easy, but is it worth it? Yes. Eye has not seen, ear has never heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that, that love him. And so there's a test, but I tell you what, keep pressing on, friends, as Paul says in Hebrews chapter 12. Let's go now to the book of Psalm 102. Look at Psalm 102, and we're going to put a few verses together here, and notice what David says here in Psalm 102. And we'll look at verse, um, now nah, Psalm 101. Look at verse 101. It says here in verse 1 and 2, I will sing of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord. Will I sing? Verse 2, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within mine house with a what? With a perfect heart. Listen, we all put on our Christian smiles, and we should when we become the church, right? We should be happy and open to each other and willing to serve. But really, friends, doesn't character, isn't it, determine what we do behind closed doors? How we live our lives when we're by ourselves. Doesn't that really? God sees everything. The Bible says his eyes are open naked to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Everything is open to God's view, right? But God is merciful. He loves us. He's patient with us. He's long-suffering. But what we do behind closed doors is really what determines character. Notice he says, I will set no wicked thing. Look at Psalm chapter 101. He says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Verse 3, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. In other words, we have to make choices. We have to be discriminating. And I tell you, when we make that choice, when we make the choice and we act on it, the change will begin, right? The sins that appeared so overwhelming will become less and less and they'll just fall. They'll fall away and your life will continue to grow in Jesus Christ. So I'm going to put a few more images up here. By the age of 16, the statistics say that children will witness today over 200,000 acts of violence. By the age of 18, 50,000 murders and, and attempted murders. Look at this. Disputes once settled with fists between kids are now settled with guns. Every 100 hours, more youths die in the streets than were killed in the Persian Gulf War. That's U.S. News and World Report. And we can see how it's just totally destroying um, our society today. I mean, the internet now has come. Uh, the internet can be a tool for good, can it? You can do searches. You can, there's so much knowledge on the internet. But can it also be a source of evil? It is just destroying homes, destroying marriages, destroying families on every hand. It's just what I have to witness is just disheartening what's happening. We have to keep our focus on Jesus. The Bible says, I will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is what? is stayed upon thee because they trust in thee. We have to trust in him, not in ourselves, but in him. In fact, the Bible says in Romans, remember Romans chapter 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a 
living sacrifice unto God, which is our reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that which is good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. So the Bible says it is the normal thing that we should be conformed to the Lord Jesus Christ and his word. In fact, look at 1 John chapter 2. This is what the Bible says right here. 1 John chapter 2. Towards the back of your Bible, beginning in verse 15, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is going to pass away. And the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God shall abide forever. And I met people who say, you know what? I don't like this. I don't want God in my life like this. He's restricting me. But think about this. If you love somebody, if you have a spouse or uh, someone that you love that's in your life, you know, you want them to care about the details of your life, right? You want them to be involved and to have an opinion because they are one. You're one. The Bible says you become one flesh, right? So we should invite that. We should welcome that. But sometimes people say, you know what? I don't like God telling me what I can and can't eat. But God cares about our health, right? It's not what tastes good. It's about what is good for us. He wants us to have long life and a clear mind so that we can be ready for his soon coming. He will never ask us to give up something unless he has something better for us. This is the purpose of Scripture. Why will you die, saith the Lord? Choose life. I came to give it to you and give it more abundantly. This is the heart of God. Amen? The very heart of God, what he wants for each and every one of us. Sometimes people, you know, they, they don't want God in their life, when they, what we, we eat and what we watch and what we hear, but you know what? This is what true love is all about. I remember when I met my wife and we got married in Old Westbury, New York. I was... We're in the church, and my brother and I used to go to clubs. We used to do all kinds of stuff. I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff together. And so he came to my wedding, and he was actually saying, how are you really going to commit yourself to one woman? You know what I mean? I mean, you're not, we used to do all this stuff together, and now you're just, you know, he couldn't understand it, right? So I'm promising my life away. I do, I do. You know, I'm, I'm with her up there, and he's thinking, man, he's in prison. What is he doing? He can't do all this stuff anymore. Now, to him, it is bondage. But to me, I'm free. What made the difference? Tell me what made the difference. Love makes a difference, right? Listen, love does not take the benefit that out love gives to the other person. Love does not work, run the risk of hurting the object of the affections. And when God says something in his word, we love him, and we want to serve him, we're not going to sit there and quibble about it and try to find a way around it. We're going to do it. Amen? Why? Because we love him because he first what? He first loved us. He first loved us. I remember when I began to study and I'd leave stuff on the table. I'd get up, I'd stay up till two or three in the morning just studying. I was just engrossed in history and biblical truth and I just was, I couldn't get enough. But my wife would wake up and she'd see all the books on the table. She never said, you know what, Jason, it's divorce. You leave these books on the table again because I have to cook and put the food on the table. That's it. I'm going to divorce you. She didn't have to say that to me. All she had to do was drop a hint. Honey, I know you like to study, but please clean up after yourself. Right, ladies? Just pick it up, right? All she had to do was give a hint. If I love her, am I going to do it? Let me say, let me share this. Jesus should not have to threaten us with hell. And he doesn't threaten us, right? To get us to do something that we ought to do for him. He shouldn't have to do that. All he has to do is give us a what? A hint. And if we truly love him, are we going to do it? We're going to go beyond the commandments and choose the things that are pleasing in his sight. And we're going to refrain from the things that just may be displeasing in his sight. Now, what about the pride of life? We just read in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, the lust of the eyes, the pride of what? The pride of life. Now, Jesus, when he walked the earth, he was the God of creation, wasn't he? But yet the Bible says in Isaiah 53, there was nothing that would be desirable to him. In other words, when he walked the earth, he exhibited the character of God by living a humble life. Are you with me? The contrast to the pride and the pomp of the world, the Gentiles, was so evident. And this is what draw people to him. He was the one that had all the riches in the world, right? But yet he wore only a crown of thorns on our behalf. I know about the pride of life. So many have asked about my history and I said, you know what, I'll put an image, but I'm going to make it really quick, okay? I used to be in competitive bodybuilding. And uh, let's see if it's up there. 
That's me 23, 24 years ago when I competed here in North Texas. And so I know about the pride of life, and I told you the story about my going to Europe and how the Lord stopped me from going to Europe. And I tell you what, I've never looked back. Am I tempted? Yes. Is that a weakness for me? Absolutely. But you know what? I'm looking at the prize tonight. Amen? Jesus is more than anything the world can offer. I mean, his beauty, his character is what I want. Really, in the end, it's really what I want. So the Bible says the pride of life. Let me tell you a story before I enter into this next subject that we're going to be talking about that the Bible clearly reveals, all right? Many churches don't talk about this because they've fallen from the truth. The Babylon has fallen, right? Because a lot of people want to hear what they believe already. In other words, they don't want to hear things that will require a change in their life. But I believe we're living in a time where God is wanting us to prepare for heaven. Do you believe that? I really do believe that. There was an old Quaker guy, a farmer with his wife in their log cabin. And this guy was as timid as they come. I mean, he was timid. He wouldn't even hurt a fly, literally speaking. So you can imagine the stress of his wife when she needed to get something done that required the man to do the job, right? One night, they're reading together. They close the book, turn out the light. They go to bed, and they hear a few moments later someone downstairs breaking into the window. The first person under the covers was her husband. He's shaking under the covers. He doesn't know what to do. She says, honey, get out of bed and take care of this or we're going to die. Someone's breaking in. He wouldn't do anything. So finally she turns and she takes her heels and kicks him out of bed. He takes the covers with him, thump, right on the ground. So he gets up and he's shaking and he goes into the closet. He opens the door and turns on the light and he grabs that double barrel shotgun and cracks the barrel. He's fumbling the shells everywhere. Finally gets two nice big shells, puts them in, puts the barrel back, goes out on the landing, right? And the, the gun is just shaking. So he, sure enough, he sees this young man that's dressed up and he's breaking into the window. He gets in the house and the young man looks up, gets surprised, and the, the Quaker guy has that double barrel pointing right at his chest. And this is what he says. He says, young man, you stay right there or shoot. But I mean you no harm. <laughs> All right. I've got a double barrel, okay? I'm about to shoot. Are you with me? But I mean you no harm. Everybody here knows, listen, I may not know you as good. I know others better, but you know I love you. Amen? And I will share this wherever I go. So I'm not isolating anybody here tonight. I'm sharing the Bible truth. What does the Bible say about the wearing of jewelry? Is it clear in the Bible? Does God talk about, you know, the wearing of ornamentation? Let me read something from John Wesley, who was the founder of the Methodist Church. Um, John Wesley says this. He says, I exhort you to wear no gold or pearls or precious stones. I do not advise women to wear rings, earrings, or necklaces. He says, they are not even worth defending. Therefore, give them up. Let them drop. Throw them away without another word. Else a little needle may cause much pain in the flesh, a little self-indulgence much hurt to your soul. Now, this was a man of God, but we don't take his word for it, right? We don't take his word for it. So where does he base this from? Let's go to the very beginning. There's nothing wrong with gold and diamonds and rubies and jewelry because who made them? Are they beautiful? They're great to look at. It's amazing. But even in heaven, did you know that Lucifer was wearing all these jewels as his covering? Do you realize that he would stand next to God? He was the covering cherub. He was the angel that had two wings, and he would cover the glory of God. So when God's glory would, would shine, it would reflect off of Lucifer. And of course, that light and that glory was a, a, a place of attraction. And all the other angels would look at him. And he slowly but surely began to look at himself, right? And he began to fall away. Notice the Bible says that. Let's go to the book of Ezekiel 28 quickly, and let's read this. From the very beginning, notice how it all began. Ezekiel chapter 28. And let's look at verse 13. It describes Lucifer before his fall. Beginning in verse 13, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, the topaz, and the diamond, the burnel, the onyx, the jasper, sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that I was created. Thou art the anointed cherubim that covereth, and I have set thee so. That was upon the holy mountain of God. You have walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You were perfect in thy ways from the day that you were created till iniquity was found in thee. Look at verse 17 for the sake of time. Your heart or thine heart was lifted up because of your what? Because of your beauty. It goes on to say, 
You have corrupted your wisdom by reason of your what? Whose brightness was it really, friends? The Lord's, right? But it reflected off him because of all the jewels that he wore as his attire. The Bible goes on to say, I will cast thee to the ground, I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. So we can see kind of where it started. But have we all been bitten by the serpent? In other words, are we all fighting self? Yes, so it's natural. There's nothing wrong with looking good. There's nothing wrong with presenting ourselves in a professional way and looking attractive, right? But notice what the Bible does say about the wearing of these rocks and jewels, etc., upon ourselves. Let's go now to the book of Exodus, or Genesis now. Let's go to Genesis, and I think it's chapter 33. It may be chapter 35. Let me see. Yeah, chapter 35. Let's go to Genesis 35, and beginning in verse 2. Jacob is leaving Laban, his uncle, going to visit his brother Esau for the first time since he deceived him. And, um, or he's actually, a revival's taking place because many of his family were kind of half in, half out, you know? They didn't really have a lot of knowledge, so Jacob realized a revival has to take place. Look at verse 2. This is just an experience, it's just a story, but we're going to gather something from the story. Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods that were in their hand, and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak, which was by Shechem. So Jacob, before he entered to the promised land, and says, There has to be a revival among us. Judgment was taking place. He says, Hey, let's cleanse ourselves. And notice the result of the, of the revival, right? They took off the ornamentation. They buried it in the ground. This happened with Moses and the children of Israel as well. So let's look at Exodus chapter 33. Exodus 33. And let's begin reading in verse 30. God is promising them the land of Canaan. In verse 3 it says, Into a land flowing with milk and honey. For I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. And when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned, and no man did put on him his ornaments. For the Lord has said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, You are stiff-necked people, I will come up in the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore now put away your ornaments, that I may know what to do unto thee. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Horeb. And so they stripped themselves. This is a revival once again. That took place. Now, in, in the book of Hosea, chapter 3, verse 13, it says there that when the Israelites went back to the world away from God, it says that they put back on all of their ornaments yet again. Now, there's people who never even heard this before. They don't know this, right? They have good intentions. They just don't understand what the Bible says. And, but as we learn, listen, the Bible says, follow the light while you have the light. Amen. The path of the just is as a shining light that shines more and more unto the perfect day. Notice this. Let's go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 4. This is describing um, a revival in the last days. I'm going to show you. Isaiah, chapter 4. And notice verse 1. That phrase we're going to read here in verse 1, in that day. You find that in the book of Isaiah, chapter um, 28 as well. In that day is a phrase that has the final application when, friends? In the last days, right? So look at verse 1 of chapter 4. It says, and in that day, what does a woman represent in Bible prophecy? A church, right? So in that day, seven women. The number seven is the number of plenitude, completeness. In that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, we will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. So here you have the churches, right? The word bread in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 1 through 4 is a representation of the Word of God. So you have seven women, you have the churches complete, right? In the end of time, they're going to want to believe what they want to believe, not what God feeds them. They're going to wear what they want to wear, not what God sets as far as the standard, but they want to take the name of the man that stands for them to take away the reproach. So who would be the one man? They want the name of who? Right. Remember what Jesus said in the last days? Many will say, Lord, Lord, haven't we done this and this and this in whose name? In your name, but Jesus will say, depart from me, I never what? I never knew who you were, right? So they knew he was, but he didn't know who they were. So they take hold of the one man, they take away the reproach. Look at the next verse. Look at verse 2. It says, in that day shall the branch, Jesus is the branch, we are the uh, followers, right? 
He's the vine, we're the branches. The Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent, and calmly for them there escaped of Israel. And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called, what? Holy, even every one that is written among the living in Jerusalem. When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughter of Zion and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst of thee, therefore, or thereof, by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. So the Bible says the judgment is going to do a work that's going to cleanse God's people. As he's cleansing the heavenly temple, so the people on earth are going to cleanse themselves of all earthliness. He's going to wash away the filth. You know how God's going to wash it away? In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Husband, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he may cleanse it with the washing of the water by the what? By the word. And present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle. So the word is that detergent, isn't it? That God's going to cleanse internally in the last days. He's not going to force himself. All he has to do is give a hint, right? Don't just keep the commandments, but go beyond that and choose the things that are what? That are pleasing in his sight. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. And by the way, if you want to read what God's going to cleanse in chapter 4 that we just read, Start in Isaiah 3, beginning in verse 18, and read on. God will show you what he's going to cleanse in the last days. So let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3, and let's look now at verse 1. It says here, here Peter takes the very foundation, the principle of what we're looking at today. He says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, or the life of the wives. So that's a beautiful promise, isn't it? I meet people all the time that, you know, have loved ones that are not believers and they want to know, what do I do? And I say all the time, you live the life that you know. You live for Jesus, you obey what you know is right, and your example will draw them to Christ. Even though you don't see it overnight, they're staring at the ceiling at night when they see your good works, right? And they're being drawn to Christ. And in time, it may take a time, but in time, they're going to come full circle. We have the promise of God right here. So that's a beautiful promise, all right? Now look at verse 2. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with the fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of the plating of the hair, which means that in those days the plating of the hair was like Daniel chapter 3, the head of gold, where people would interlace their hair, the ladies would, with a lot of gold. So you can imagine it's talking about caste, a show of wealth. It was an obvious thing. That's what it's talking about. It doesn't mean you can't look nice, can't prepare yourself. That's not what it's talking about. It's an obvious show of caste and wealth. They had gold in their hair. But then it says here, uh, and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So what does God really value? What does he value? The outward or the inside? The heart, right? And what's in the heart will be shown on the outside. The apostle Paul says, when we came into this world, we brought nothing in, and surely when we leave, we'll carry nothing out, right? The only thing we're going to carry is a character after the similitude of our divine Savior, Jesus Christ, as he's working in us. Let's go to the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, towards the back towards um, the Gospels here. 1 Timothy chapter 2, and we'll just read one more. That's it. It says here in verse 9, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair, there's that it again, or gold, or pearls, or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. And we can see the contrast of the two women of Revelation 12 versus Revelation chapter 17. One is decked, the other has the righteousness of Jesus Christ. They're following what Jesus has said. They're following the word of God. And so the devil today, he's trying to deface the image of God, isn't he? He's trying to uh, belittle that which God has made to glorify his name. So there's nothing evil in jewels. There's nothing evil in jewelry in itself. But as far as the Christian and how they carry themselves, God says it's better that we stay away from it, right? It's better we let it drop. That, not that you can't have it if it reminds you of something, but God says, represent me when you go into the world and I will be glorified in the works that you do. Amen? By his grace. We're choosing the things that are pleasing in his sight. Galatians 4, verse 16. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Amen? I tell you what Jesus wore for me. 
He came from his glory. He says, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. You know what he said? I will become sin who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In other words, the infinite creator came from his glory. He wore nails on his hands and his feet. And he put a crown upon his head, a crown of thorns. What a contrast to the picture that the world gives of Christ today. What Jesus wants to see is a broken spirit, doesn't he? A contrite heart. He says, God will not despise. That's what he wants to see. We're living in a time, perilous times, where there's so many attractions, so many distractions as well. It takes courage. It takes courage, not just to keep God's commandments, but to say, you know what? I'm going to go beyond that. I'm going to choose the things that are pleasing in the sight. And God does not have to warn us. All he has to do is give a hint in these last days. And that type of spirit is going to make up a group of people that no man could number, standing on the sea of glass. And they will sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. They will say, great and marvelous are your ways, Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, thou King of Saints. And the Bible says, when that day comes, we're going to walk on the streets of gold. You know what that means? The gold, the precious metal, is going to be under our feet. The value is going to be above it. The precious soul who walks on it. The Bible says in that day, you can read this, by the way. In that day, God says, I will make up my jewels. Malachi chapter 3. You want to read that, by the way, in closing? Let's go to Malachi 3. Notice what God's going to make up. Malachi chapter 3. Yeah, God has jewels that he wants to see. And notice what they are. Malachi. Now this message tonight, we're not saved by what we take off or what we wear, amen? But we're, all, we're past that point, aren't we? We want to be ready for Jesus when he comes. We want to be the living saints, do we not? We want to be that trophy showcase when he breaks the clouds of blue that he can see the travail of his soul. Look at Malachi chapter 3 now, beginning in verse 16. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that fear the Lord and that thought upon his name. And God says in verse 17, And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts. They shall be mine. Notice, what, notice the heart desire. Notice what God values. It's the people, right? It says, They shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts. In that day when I make up my what? These are his jewels. And I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked. Between him that serves God and him that serveth him not. I pray tonight, the 144,000, that we're all part of that great number. I pray that our choice tonight is to follow the Lamb wherever he goes. That we stand before the throne of God without fault in the righteousness of Jesus by faith. Father in heaven, thank you again for giving us health and strength and giving us such an in-depth understanding of what it means to truly follow Jesus Christ. We want to please you for there's so much pain and suffering in the world. We want to put a smile upon your face and we know that we're just begun. We have so much time to spend with you in your everlasting kingdom. How much more we're going to learn in comparison to this brief period on this earth. It's just unbelievable. So I just pray that you will strengthen our faith and bring us back together safely tomorrow evening is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.